you all for coming tonight, and uh, thank you all for those of you who are on HA Live watching us from around the world. A couple announcements to make before we get started, for especially for those of you on HA Live. Heritage opened in Los Angeles last week. Our Beverly Hills Gallery opened uh, last Monday, and it is located at the corner of Olympic Boulevard and Beverly Drive at 9478 West Olympic Boulevard. So for our clients in Southern California, we will be holding exhibitions and sales and um, all other types of business in our new Beverly Hills office. Our New York City office is open later this year, so stay tuned for announcements there. On behalf of the uh, 350 worldwide members of the Heritage family, I am Greg Rowan. I'm the president of Heritage, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. I'm especially glad that Aaron Baker, our distinguished speaker, is here tonight because Aaron came from Chicago, and when I was standing in the kitchen this morning getting ready to go to the office, I was watching CNN as they were talking about two-hour delays and the potential of uh, O'Hare being closed because of a snowstorm. I get to the office and have an email from Aaron saying that his flight has been canceled. And all I could think of was all of you who came out here tonight uh, trying to reach you and tell you that we had been uh, uh, rescheduled. But such was not the case. Aaron was able to get on a later flight and made his way out of the frigid north country and make it here tonight. Um, before we get started, I will briefly introduce and tell you that Aaron Baker, as, if, um, as I believe you already know, is the curator of the Playboy magazine collection. He is the Playboy, the curator of all the artwork that Playboy magazine has accumulated and acquired over the last half century. And I know there are at least some of you out there who only read the magazine for the cartoons and for the artwork. But the artwork and the cartoons that are in Playboy magazine have, over the last half century plus, achieved iconic status in the art market. Aaron is the person in charge of the Playboy archives, which includes such fabulous works as those by Salvador Dali, Tom Vesselman, Andy Warhol, Franz Klein, and many, many others. He works with galleries, museums, and publishers to bring a higher awareness to Playboy's history and to highlight the role that the magazine and its artists have made on the history of America. Last month at Second Tuesday at Slocum's lecture series, we brought to you the curator of an American icon's art collection, that of Neiman Marcus. And tonight we bring you the curator of another American icon's art collection, that of Playboy magazine. Aaron is the business development director for Playboy's licensing group, as well as in charge of their book project, and serves as media representative for Playboy throughout the country. A very, very busy job, to say the least. He is, has taught as an adjunct professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and at Northwestern University, where he led a seminar on contemporary art. He served on the Exhibition Selections Committee for the Chicago Cultural Center and is also the chairman of the board for the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. Aaron received his BFA from the University of North Texas, so in many ways this is a homecoming for you tonight. That was in 1994. And he received his MFA from the University of Nevada at Las Vegas in 1998. We are very honored that Playboy's curator and chief archivist for their magnificent collection is here with us tonight. This is our fourth year at Heritage Auction Galleries to be in partnership with Playboy. You will notice the auction catalogs that are on your chairs and that are online for everyone watching online. The Playboy Hugh Hefner's Funnies. This is a selection of 100 pieces of original art, just a tiny representative sample from Playboy's vast archives of original art. Have a look at the catalog because every one of those pieces, every one of those 100 pieces are unique, one-of-a-kind original works of art from the Playboy archives. Once they are sold, they are irreplaceable. So if you have, like I did, looked through the, the uh, booklet the other day and noticed cartoons that I saw years and years and years and years ago that were nostalgic, that I remembered from, from a, a different time. And I thought, gosh, that would be really wonderful to have an original piece of art. They're not tremendously expensive, and the opportunity to acquire something from the Playboy archives um, is truly a unique once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. 
So have a look and um, enjoy the art and enjoy Aaron Baker's talk tonight. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Uh, can everyone hear me? I want to thank, oh, no, I, I've got uh, wireless mic here, but thank you very much. I want to thank not only um, Greg, but also uh, Jared and Todd and, and Ed and everyone here at Heritage for inviting me to come and speak about Playboy. Uh, usually I do this at Playboy at our headquarters in Chicago, walking and talking um, as I walk through the, the space and uh, point out the artworks that are in the collection. It's nice to have the opportunity to come uh, back to the Dallas area and talk about Playboy with all of you. Like uh, Greg said, this is somewhat of a homecoming for me. And um, I also want to thank my friends from UNT from uh, the 1990s uh, for coming out and, and saying hello today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about Playboy and uh, the art collection. As Greg mentioned, I, I'm the curator of that collection. And uh, what that means is that I take care of about 5,000 works of art on a daily basis that are spread out over our various offices. We have our headquarters in Chicago. We have uh, several facilities in LA, including the Playboy Mansion. Uh, and we have an office in London. And in all of these offices, we have artwork uh, all over the walls. In addition to the art that we have in those spaces, we have a warehouse just outside of Chicago that would remind you of the last scene from the Raiders of the Lost Ark where they're putting the ark away, you know, and it's just, they pull back and it's just a crate after crate after crate. Uh, that's what our warehouse looks like, uh, full of artworks that have appeared in the magazines as well as uh, posterity items that we have kept from the Playboy Club, from the old Chicago mansion, because as many of you know or remember, uh, there was originally a Playboy mansion in Chicago uh, which no longer exists, and now we have the mansion in L.A. So we kept some items from the Chicago mansion, and we also have our editorial archive there, um, which I also manage, and that would be all of the, the, the uh, transcripts of interviews, uh, all of the interview galleys, uh, all of the memoranda among the various editors or from editors to writers, all of those documents are kept in that facility as well. Um, the Playboy collection is very unique uh, in regards to corporate collections. It's unique in a few key ways, the first being that it is really a magazine archive, first and foremost. You know, I like to refer to it as the accidental art collection. It was never intended to be an art collection, and so when you come to the offices of, of Playboy and you see all of these artworks on the wall, um, you're really seeing magazine commissions uh, that we're very lucky to have because Hugh Hefner and the editors had the foresight uh, to keep these works early on, you know, when they could have very easily been destroyed or, or been given back to artists. Um, so, you know, unlike a lot of companies that go and buy art to decorate the walls or, you know, to collect a certain artist, uh, for example, LaSalle Bank, which was recently bought by Bank of America, um, and has their headquarters in Chicago, is famous for their photography collection. And you go there, and all you see is photography. Um, you know, unlike a company like that, we just accumulated all of this artwork through the commissions process. And so another reason that is so distinct is because, you know, since we did commission all of this art for all kinds of features over five decades, since we debuted in uh, December of 1953, um, the collection has a lot of variety both in subject matter and also medium. So you see oil paintings, you see you know, watercolors, you see collages, uh, you see drawings, uh, you see sculpture. We even commissioned a lot of sculpture that appeared in the magazine as illustration back when not a lot of magazines were doing that. Um, you also see a lot of variety in the artists represented. So you see works by um, you know, those very famous significant figures like Greg mentioned to you earlier, like Salvador Dali and Tom Wesselman, Andy, War Andy Warhol, and uh, Rosenquist, and Franz Klein, and, and people like that. Um, but I would say the, the vast majority of the works that you see were made by people who aren't necessarily household names. And you'll see many of those works today. You'll also see uh, a Wesselman, and you'll see a Warhol. Uh, but for me, as the curator, I can tell you that you know, some of the most joyous moments that I've had 
managing this collection have been when I've discovered an artist's work, an artist I've never heard of, you know, who did some super cool mid-century illustration of guys in tuxedos and skinny ties, drinking martinis and living the Playboy lifestyle. You know, this kind of madman uh, sort of vibe uh, that was depicted in the magazine, espoused by the magazine, really, on a regular basis in the 50s and 60s. Um, in particular, today, I've, I've brought some slides towards the middle of my presentation of an exhibition we did recently called The Great Indoors, which is all about bachelor pads. And I'm going to show you some bachelor pad art. And uh, I would be surprised if you've heard of any of these illustrators. Actually, you know, given that we're at Heritage and many of you are collectors, you, you might have. Uh, but I can tell you that most of the people who come through Playboy haven't heard of these guys, but um, they tend to think that these illustrations are, are pretty cool. So as, uh, as I said just a few moments ago, we started in 1953. And, uh, you know, the magazine was edited, published, and created by uh, khakis wearing, Pepsi swilling, 27 year old kid from the west side of Chicago. And, um, you know, this was one of his, his great dreams was to have a men's magazine. Uh, he, you know, he had labored at various jobs, uh, like working with Carson Peary Scott as a copy editor, and then later on uh, working for Esquire, uh, pretty much in the same role. You know, in his heart, he really wanted to be a publisher. So here you have Hugh Marston Hefner working on his little card table uh, on the west side of Chicago, and this is an image of him uh, putting the magazine together. When he was working at Esquire, he asked for a $5 raise. I don't know how many of you know this story, but he asked for a $5 raise, and Esquire told him no. So he decided to go and start his own magazine. Uh, years later, after Playboy had become so successful, Esquire sent him a check for $5, <laughs> which he framed and which hangs in the uh, game room at the Playboy Mansion. Um, so, you know, he always wanted to be a publisher. And even in his, uh, his early years in, in middle school and high school, he was publishing magazines and books of various kinds. Um, in, in the, in the uh, Los Angeles Playboy Mansion, he has a scrapbook archive, which is separate from the archives that I manage. He's a big scrapbooker, Hugh Hefner. Every day he works on his scrapbook. You know, just like your, your aunt goes into her little scrapbooking room and she cuts things out and pastes them into the scrapbook, uh, so does Hugh Hefner. The difference between his scrapbook and your aunt's scrapbook would be that his scrapbook is 3,000 volumes long. And he's been working on it since he was in junior high. And it, ha it contains every letter that was ever sent to him. It, it has every greeting card from a president or from Frank Sinatra, you know, some other celebrity that was ever sent to him. Uh, it contains check stubs and, you know, various mementos from his life. But I think most importantly, it contains his early comic books. Because when he was in middle school, he started drawing comic books. And um, he would illustrate the scenes from his daily life. So we're going to come back to this slide. But I want to show you this one of a page from School Days, which was his high school comic about his life at uh, Steinmetz High School, which is a high school that still exists in Chicago. It's on the west side. He called it Think Much High School. And he made this comic that was all about his life and the lives of his friends. And he came up with a name for himself. Gu Heffer was his comic book name. And so he, he, he drew these comic books and uh, colored them. And then he would uh, staple them together. And he would make complete books. And there were volumes, you know, so one might have a narrative that involved him asking a girl to a dance, and another one might be about a big football game at the high school or whatever. Uh, but every day he would work on it. In addition to school days, uh, he also made his own monster magazine. So he came up with a, a monster uh, fan club, and he made a magazine for it. And he would send, say, Boris Karloff a letter. And when Boris Karloff would write back, he would take the letter and put it in the magazine, you know, along with a picture of Boris Karloff. He was really into monsters and monster magazines, so he created his own. So from uh, his very early days, he was an editor and a publisher. 
This is from a comic book called Tess. And it might surprise you to learn that he actually drew this while he was creating the first issue of Playboy in 1953. So this is a page that shows him at work at it on his typewriter. And that's his wife, Millie. Uh, and he's in his apartment in Hyde Park. And basically on this page, he's just saying, man, I hope that all this hard work's going to pay off in January when I launch this men's magazine. Okay, So the first time that I ever went out and saw his scrapbook in LA, I was just blown away by the scale of it. And uh, you know, just kind of the, the, the epic uh, tale of this guy uh, throughout his teenage years and into his 20s through the success of Playboy up to the present day because he still works on it to this day. But there were a couple of volumes that fascinated me more than any other. And they are volumes 52 and 53 of um, Heft Scrapbook. And that's because those contain the Heft comic books that he drew in the very early days of Playboy. So, you know, for me, somebody who works with Playboy history on a daily basis, who knows names like Art Paul, Art Paul is our original art director, um, and knows some, something about how it all unfolded in the early days, back when Heft borrowed $8,000 from his parents and his friends, and he mortgaged his furniture. He had some cool Eames furniture, and he mortgaged his furniture um, so that he could start this men's magazine, um, you know, with a skeleton crew of a couple of friends and this freelance guy named Art Paul. It was really cool for me to see all of these characters drawn in these comic books and, and to understand that he was drawing those at the end of each day. So, so for example, one page shows him talking with his friend Eldon Sellers, which is, is a friend of his from college who helped uh, create Playboy. Uh, and they're discussing the name of the magazine. And so just like this, you see these panels where in one panel it's Hef and in one panel it's Eldon and they're having a conversation. And they're trying to figure out what to do now because they were going to call the magazine Stag Party. Okay, that was going to be Playboy's original name. Uh, and they even created a stag mascot for the magazine. And Hef was going forward with that title and there were a lot of stag illustrations in the first issue. Then he received a letter from um, Stag, Stag Magazine, telling him that he would not name his magazine Stag Party because uh, you know they were named Stag and he would be sued if if he went ahead with this title. So this comic book shows them figuring out you know what they're going to call the magazine now. So uh, it's really just drawings of Hef kind of leaning back and holding his chin and going, hmm, Eldon, what do we do? You know, Stag's going to sue us. And then Eldon going, I don't know, Hef. You know, how about Playboy? And that's pretty much how they came up with Playboy. Uh, in a pinch, under the threat of lawsuits, you know, knowing that this magazine was about to come out and they needed a, a title for it. And so the two of them kicked around some ideas and they came up with the name Playboy. And this comic book shows them doing that, you know, and it's just really cool to know that at the end of the day, Hef was sitting down and drawing these. Uh, his big aspiration actually was to be a cartoonist. A lot of people don't know that. His big dream was to be Hugh Hefner, the cartoonist. And had he been successful at that, I wouldn't be standing here today. So I'm very lucky that in many ways, Hef is a failed cartoonist because that means that he was able to pursue his, uh, his other big dream, which was to have this men's magazine. Um, so he launched Playboy in December of 1953, but he didn't give up his dream of being a cartoonist entirely because the first couple of issues actually featured some of his cartoons. And this is one uh, from the second issue, which was the January 1954 uh, issue. And the caption to it is, thanks, Charlie. It's just what I wanted. How did you know my size? Not a lot of laughs. Um, this is a cartoon that's featured in our uh, upcoming comic auction with Heritage. And for us, it's a very iconic work of art, you know, because it's drawn by Hef. It appeared in the second issue of the magazine. But it also, it represents, uh, it, it represents both a, a forgotten dream of Hef and also the realization and the, the, the full blossoming of another dream. Shortly after this, Hef stopped drawing cartoons for Playboy. He could now afford to hire actual cartoonists uh, to come and make work for the magazine. But in the early days, it was a necessity, right? I mean, he was working on a shoestring budget, and uh, it helped 
if he could actually draw some of the art himself. That meant that he didn't have to pay other artists. He also was hoping that you know people would really like the cartoons and he could become a regular contributor to his own magazine. So this is the cover of the very first issue of Playboy. Um, again, it debuted in December of 53. To say that this magazine was an overnight success is a cliche, but it is absolutely true. It, it has no date on it, you'll note. So it doesn't say December 1953 on it anywhere. Also, if you have that first issue, you know that Hef's name does not appear inside in any way. Um, and that's because he was sure it was going to fail. And he didn't want to be associated with it if it failed. You know? he, did, he didn't want people to know that Hugh Hefner had published this magazine if it was a bomb. He left the date off the cover because he thought that by doing so, he could fool the newsstands into leaving it on the newsstand for, for a longer period of time if it didn't sell. Because, of course, at the end of every month, the newsstand sell, sends back any unsold copies of that magazine. So he figured by leaving that date off, the, the newsstands would just scratch their heads and say, well, there's no date on it, so I don't know, maybe it's a January issue. Let's just leave it on, and he could recoup more of his original investment that way. So they printed about 50,000 copies of this first issue, and, uh, and they sold out in a very short period of time. And then suddenly Hugh Hefner was scrambling, trying to figure out how he was going to put together a second issue of this magazine. I mean, they literally did not have a plan for the January 1954 issue of Playboy. One thing he knew, though, was that if this men's magazine took off, he was going to have cartoons in it. And not only was he going to include cartoons in Playboy, but he was going to hire a lot of his heroes. Because again, you know, he just wasn't willing to give up this dream of being a cartoonist entirely. If he couldn't be a cartoonist himself, then he'd be a cartoon editor. And so that's what he basically decided to become, was a cartoon editor. And to this day, he's really the cartoon editor for Playboy. Um, it surprises a lot of people to hear that He's involved with the magazine on a daily basis. Still approves every Playmate, uh, every photograph for that matter that appears in the magazine. Um, but I think it's fair to say that after the Playmates, that the cartoons are his, his second greatest love and his second uh, greatest interest when it comes to our content. And I guess we all can understand why there's that particular hierarchy of Playmates and cartoons. Um, this is a cartoon by Jack Cole. And many of you know Jack Cole as the artist who um, created the comic book Plastic Man. And you know he was very successful as a comic book artist and uh, you know, worked for Playboy. After he had basically exited the comic book world, the government decided to crack down on comic books. You know, the industry essentially um, buckled to government pressure and you know, started started uh, trying to hem the cartoon, the comic book artists in, and and uh, you know, make the comic books like more conservative. And everybody was concerned that comic books were ruining the youth at the time. You know, later it was television. Originally, it was comic books. And so Jack Cole and a lot of other artists um, got out of the business, you know, because it wasn't fun anymore, and because they they didn't feel like they could really be creative and do what they needed to do. So. So Jack Cole came to Playboy and started doing these gag cartoons uh, for us. And this is a very early one. And the caption is, I ain't got nobody, like the song. But she's referring to the fact that she, she's talking about her body and how she doesn't have a body. Clearly, she does. Uh, Jack is uh, one of the most beloved cartoonists. Um, to appear in Playboy, certainly my favorite cartoonist, was just a master. And um, did a great body of work for us until he unfortunately committed suicide in the late 50s. I think 58 maybe, Jared, you know? I think 57 or 58. So, so his work is pretty rare. There isn't a whole lot of it. Um, but certainly among the best cartoons that were ever made for Playboy. This is another work here. This one is in our sale later this month with Heritage. Uh, there's no caption for this cartoon. I just like it because this guy has a pipe like half. This is a cartoon by Eldon Dugini. 
Um, Houdini, like many other cartoonists, worked for Esquire originally. And uh, Esquire you know, did a similar thing, decided that it was going to bow to public pressure and make its magazine more conservative and would do so by taking out a lot of the art, and particularly any art that, it, that, that they saw to be too risque. And so uh, artists like uh, Vargas and Houdini got dropped by the magazine and then eventually made their way to Playboy. Um, the uh, caption of this Houdini cartoon is, well, I guess it goes to prove that not all God's children got rhythm. This is another Houdini here, no caption. Just uh, Santa Claus at a gentleman's club. One of my favorites. And what we did for these cartoonists was we allowed them to be expressive again. We allowed them to, you know, be as body as they wanted to be within limits. Um, you know, they, there were still some things that in 1962, uh, you know, you couldn't show in a magazine. But we allowed them the freedom, you know, to, to depict sexuality, uh, to take on political themes, you know, to be racy, to be controversial. And, um, you know, we like to say that our cartoonists have been equal offenders over the years. You know, they equal opportunity offenders. They, they have lambasted men and women and high society, low society, you know, Republicans, Democrats, you name it. And uh, so if you look at the cartoons as a body of work over the decades, um, you're really able to see the way that America's changed. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating to go in and to work on a project like the Heritage, Auc Heritage Auction and to have to go through decades of cartoon art and to see the various trends that have com come and gone, the various issues that were current issues in their day that are no longer current. Uh, like, uh, for example, I can't tell you, you know, how many Nixon cartoons I saw. And, you know, these days, you don't see a lot of Nixon cartoons. I saw a lot of cartoons about swinging and tea parties. You know, there was a time when it was on the public um, mind enough that you could put a cartoon in a magazine about having a tea party and people would know what that was enough that they would laugh. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Ice Storm, but it has a great depiction of a, of a tea party. And there were a lot of cartoons in the archives uh, about swinging. You know, cartoons about pot and uh, drugs in the 1960s, cartoons about the birth of rock and roll, you know, it's really like a, a visual tapestry that takes you through the history of America, and in particular, um, you know, the political changes and the, the, soci the social changes that took place in the 60s and 70s. This is a work by Shel Silverstein. A lot of people don't realize that Shel got his start with Playboy. He's another Chicago guy, also from the west side of Chicago. And, um, you know, not long after Playboy started, I think in late 56, uh, Shell just showed up at the office with a portfolio of work and asked to be seen by Hef, and Hef came out. These, these, you know, these were the days when you could go down to Playboy's offices and ask to see Hef, and he would just kind of come out of the back drinking a Pepsi and, you know, ask to see your portfolio. And that's the way it happened for Shell. And so, um, so Hef came out and saw the cartoons and loved them, and Shell ended up being a regular contributor for know, several decades, and he, along with Leroy Neiman, who we'll talk about in a little while, ended up with one of the best gigs at Playboy. He basically became a, like an artist in residence, you know, hanging out at all the Playboy parties, hanging out with Hef at the mansion, hanging out on the Big Bunny jet, which was Hef's uh, private DC-9, and just traveling the world making cartoons about his life. Collectively, they're referred to as Silverstein Around the World, and actually, um, we published a book of that title just a few years ago. It, it's a great collection of his cartoons. He would go to a hippie uh, colony. You know, he would go to uh, he'd go to Paris. He'd go to Tokyo, and he would make cartoons um, about his stay. And typically, he was a character in his cartoons. And the the general uh, gag was that he was this Midwestern rube trying to find his way through Paris, and hilarity would ensue. This is kind of an unusual work. I don't know. You can't see it all that well, I don't think, and I'm sorry for that um, since it's black and white. But this is called The Disguise, and this is just a, a single page 
cartoon is usually his cartoons of, would go over six or seven pages in the magazine. Um, and this is a single page showing this guy who's taking off this disguise and he ends up pulling off his entire head and then his real head pops out from underneath. I was having a great discussion earlier with uh, Jared and Todd and the folks here at Heritage about um, Silverstein's work and how you know his cartoons are among my favorites. And one of the reasons is that you know you don't see much of it here, but with m with most of the work, um, you can see his hand very well. He was not the greatest draftsman in the world, Charles Silverstein. I have to tell you, but he was a great cartoonist. You know, his ideas were good. Um, he he executed them well enough. He was a great writer. He wrote a lot of comedy for other uh, comedians and wrote. Uh, came up with cartoon gags for other cartoonists. He's a songwriter. He wrote A Boy Named Sue for Johnny Cash. He's a very talented guy. But he wasn't the most natural draftsman. So a lot of his works have a lot of corrections on them where he would do pasteovers. He would just, if he didn't like the way he drew his head, he would just draw a new head and he would just slap it right on top. Because since his work was black and white and we were just going to photograph it on the copy stand, reproduce it in the magazine, he could do that. And as long as he took white out or whatever would have been the equivalent back then, like white gouache, and, and he went around the edges of that paste over, that would help the shadow drop away when we reproduced it. So here you see a paste over on the bottom right hand side. I don't know how well you can see it, but there's one there where he didn't like the final uh, depiction of this guy with a head popping out of the coat, so, so he drew another one. Um, oftentimes they also have like coffee mug ring stains on the corner, you know, or just schmutz of various kinds. Because again, he was working almost uh, like a plein air artist from the 19th century. You know, he would go to the nudist colony and he would get nude, and he would sit there in the nude and he would make cartoons of the nudist. Okay, and then typically when we reproduce the cartoons in the magazine, we'd also have some photographs of him in the nude with some strategically placed uh, black boxes. You know, thankfully, <laughs> and because uh, he also wasn't a natural beauty, so. Um, and so you would see photographs of him at the nudist camp and then also the, the cartoon. So, you know, there would be all kinds of stains on them. Sometimes the, the paper that he worked on uh, was just whatever he could find at the time. Newsprint or butcher paper um, typically was not archival. And, of course, when he did the pasteovers, he'd paste them down with rubber cement. You know, that stuff dries, dries out after 10, 15 years. So oftentimes when you pull these Silverstein out of the envelope, you know, th they almost just fall apart in your hands because they're so delicate and they have so many different layers. Um, but it's part of their history, you know. Um, we had a, a, a group of archivists come through Playboy to take a tour. They had a convention in Chicago, and so they came through on a tour, and we had a Silverstein show up at the time, and, and I showed them the Silversteins, and there was a big conversation about, like, well, what are you going to do about this coffee mug ring stain in the corner over here? You know, and they were discussing, like, well, I would treat it with this kind of chemical. And if you put it in this acid bath, you could get rid of that. And I said, no way. You know, this is part of the history of this work. And um, when you look at it, you can really see, you know, the, the printing process. And you can also see his creative process, all the changes and revisions that he made. This is a page from a Little Annie Fanny cartoon. Um, a lot of you know Little Annie Fanny as the, as the comic that appeared in the back of Playboy uh, starting in 1962 and on into the 80s. Um, and then even uh, more recently than that, we, we had a few in the magazine who kind of tried to reprise this strip. But the heyday was definitely the 60s and the 70s. Uh, it was created by Harvey Kurtzman. And drawn and illustrated by Will Elder and Jack Davis and all the guys from the EC Comics crew, uh, you know, names associated with the early days of Mad Magazine. So the same artist that did Mad Magazine did this strip for Playboy. And it was actually the second venture that Hef undertook with Kurtzman. Um, he and Harvey had published a magazine called Trump in 1957 and only lasted for two issues. It was a kind of like a Playboy version of Mad, so it was like an, a, an adult, you know, comic, and it had like a similar mix of uh, satirical 
pieces as a Mad, Mad Magazine, but just a little bit more adult-oriented. Um, it was a little ahead of its time, so it only lasted those two issues, but you know, collectors really prized those, those issues and the art that appeared in it. But later they decided that they wanted to work together again because they were, un they were dissatisfied with, the, with that collaboration and they knew they could do great things together, so they came up with Annie Fanny. And I remember when I was growing up that Annie Fanny was the first thing that stuck out to me in, in Playboy know, because it was art, and I, I loved Mad Magazine. I recognized immediately that this art was of the quality and the style of Mad Magazine, so it really resonated with me. Uh, but the pr protagonist in it, um, Annie, you know, was just hot blonde. And so as a, as a young guy, that resonated with me too. So I remember that when I found that first box of Playboys, which had been left outside of the frat house, uh, you know, on the way to my school, I used to walk to school by this frat house. The frat guys had left the, the uh, box of Playboys outside. When I found that box and, and dragged it to my tree house because it was so heavy I couldn't pick it up, so I had to drag it by the box flap. I remember opening up Playboy, and the first thing I saw was little Annie Fanny. Um, these, these strips are just amazing. If you, if you have the chance to see some in person, I really recommend that you do so. We have two stories in uh, the comic art sale coming up here at the end of the month. You know, they're like illuminated manuscripts for the 20th century. This slide does not do the level of uh, detail and love that has been put into these paintings justice. I mean, they're just, they're incredibly realized um, and beautifully rendered. We used to put one a month in the magazine, but after a while it became every other month, and then it became, you know, four or five times a year, and less and less because they just were so much work for these artists. And they were so time consuming that it just didn't make any sense anymore. Uh, Kurtzman and his gang of artists, and oftentimes four or five artists would work on one strip, just couldn't keep up with the demand. This is an early work by Leroy Neiman. And uh, again, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Leroy got his start with Playboy. Le Leroy's another Chicago guy. So kind of like the Obama White House, you know, all of the early Playboy guys are Chicago people. In particular, Leroy was a friend of half, from Half's Days at Carson Fury Scott, which is a department store in, in, uh, in Chicago. And as I mentioned earlier, Half was the copywriter there. He worked on the, the catalog. And Leroy was an illustrator for the catalog. And so they knew each other that way. And Half was always going on about how he was going to start his own magazine. And as uh, Leroy told me one time, with, with total amazement in his voice, which was so nice to hear after all these years, after years of them being friends, that he was still amazed. And he said, he did it. He actually did it. That kid was always running on at the mouth about his men's magazine, and he actually did it. Um, and when Hef started uh, Playboy, you know, this was another artist that he had always had in the back of his mind as a possible contributor that he wanted to get involved with this new venture. And so very early on in 1954, which is really the first full year of, of Playboy, the first, um, first full run of issues, because we started in December of that previous year, he hired Leroy to come and do fashion features for Playboy, because that's what he had done for Carson Fury Scott. So uh, you know, we refer to these as service features in the magazine. They're, uh, they're about clothing. Uh, sometimes they're about um, cigars or uh, or some other kind of fashion like the martini that's in vogue at that time or, or convertibles. And in the early days, Leroy was often the guy that illustrated those, those articles. So this is a very early piece here. It's called uh, Formal Wear. And so you see these guys in this kind of Mad Men type scene with their skinny ties and their, um, their martinis, you know, drinking and having a good time, living the Playboy lifestyle. That was really Leroy's job, was to depict people living the Playboy lifestyle. And he, like Shell, ended up with this incredible gig, you know, that you really couldn't ever imagine for yourself. You just kind of have to fall into. He ended up getting a regular feature in Playboy called Man at His Leisure, where he was charged with the responsibility of showing people enjoying the Playboy lifestyle all over the world in the coolest locations you could imagine, in the hottest clubs, in the best restaurants, um, you know, on the, on the slopes of Aspen, 
or wherever. And so basically he was given a lot of money to travel around and stay in the, the best hotels and eat great food and hang out with beautiful women and make art about all of that. And that's what he did. Uh, this is another early piece. This is called uh, At Eve. And here's this guy in his robe leading his playboy and drinking his cocktail. Very typical of his early work. is a painting of uh, Le Mans uh, from the late 60s. And this is you know, more representative of the later man at his leisure work. This is a large painting on panel. You know, when I came, I've got to tell you, when I came to Playboy, I really didn't know much about Leroy Neiman, but what I did know was that he was an artist who had had a very commercial career. He was the guy that made serographs of Tiger Woods. Maybe not Tiger anymore, but you know, uh, LeBron James. Or you know, whomever, sports, sports figures. He was like the sport, sports artist. But I didn't know that he had done all of this great early work for Playboy. And now I'm like a huge Leroy Neiman fan. I love all of the early work. And uh, oftentimes when I bring artists through, I have a lot of friends who are artists who come through. And, and oftentimes we have artists who are in town for exhibitions who just want to come by and see the collection. When they come through, I would say that the biggest surprise that they experience is learning about Leroy's early work and getting a sense for what he contributed to Playboy and to, um, you know, to really a, American life over the course, of, over the latter half of the 20th century. For a lot of guys, for a lot of our readers, Leroy was really their, their entree into modernism, if you will, because like a guy out in Iowa who had never been to the Museum of Modern Art and who would find a museum like that off-putting and had never seen a Jackson Pollock. This was really you know, his first exposure to a flashy, drippy, brightly colored painting that seemed you know, both fresh and exciting, uh, but also of the time. And I think one of the reasons that Leroy was so successful with the readers was because he was still an artist making representational pictures. So this is a guy who was very influenced by Jackson Pollock, who was dripping paint um, or using a palette knife, but you know who was still making pictures of race, uh, races and um, equestrian scenes and things that the readers could relate to. You know, so it was like a non-threatening way to learn about modernist art. This is another work by Leroy. It's called a Femlin. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the magazine know that the Femlin is the character who appears on the Party Jokes page. Okay, the, we've had the Party Jokes in the magazine. It's like a long-standing tradition. There was a time when if you were going to a party, maybe you'd want to be armed with a couple of icebreakers, you know, have some Party Jokes. Maybe, you know, you don't need those, those uh, icebreakers as much, but it's a tr tradition for us, and so we have these jokes in the magazine. And another tradition is having Leroy illustrate the page with the Femlin, and the Femlin is essentially a female gremlin, hence the name. So if, if she were real, she would be about 10 inches high, and she would get into all kinds of wacky mischief. All right, so this is, a, this is an original uh, watercolor of the Femlin, and this is from a, a set where she blows a bubble, and then she gets trapped in the bubble. You know, so a typical Femlin gag is, um, say, if it's uh, Halloween, she encounters a jack-o'-lantern, and you know, ends up falling into the jack-o'-lantern. Something crazy happens with the jack-o'-lantern. Okay. This is another one. Both of these are in the auction here at Heritage. Um, and here, I wanted to show you the paste-up board that it's on and make reference back to the silver screen, you know, and just point out that a lot of the art that we have in the collection looks like this. It's on a Playboy paste-up board. It has a Playboy stamp at the top. It usually has multiple stamps. Uh, sometimes you'll see a uh, stamp from the art director at the time. Um, and for many years, really up until 1982, that was Art Paul, our founding art director. And often you'll see in the stamp his actual initials, AP. And sometimes you'll see HMH, Hugh Marston Hefner, where Hef is signed off on the cartoon. We have a few in the sale where where you see Hef's initials. It's fairly rare to see those, though, um, on cartoons. It's more, it's more likely that you'll see those on a centerfold board. But sometimes you do. And you see all the, the key lining marks here for the printer. 
and then even some old uh, tape residue where there had been some scotch tape on it that had been taken off. Th again, this is a work that was never meant to be kept as, uh, as a work of art, you know, in an art collection. Uh, back in the 50s or 60s, I guarantee you that had you come into an art director's office and had you asked to see a work like this, you know, more than likely he would have reached down under his desk and like moved two or three things aside and then pulled the femlin out and blown some dust off of it and then handed it to you. You know, um, it was really only in the late 60s or early 70s that somebody said, hey, look, we've got a lot of art here. I think we should start framing this stuff. And today you come and it, it's, it's all framed, hanging on the walls, and uh, we do curated exhibitions in our space with them inside. But even when we frame a work like this, we frame it with the paste-up board visible so that you can see that history. Because for us, it's an important important part of that, um, that artwork provenance, and it tells you a lot about you know, the, the process of fabling. And I think it's just visually cool. This is a work by Alberto Vargas, which you can see here to my right. And uh, the caption for it is, I certainly enjoyed the Valentine Ball, Mr. Prentice, and the dance was fun too. Uh, so Vargas, as many of you know, was a pinup artist who started out with Esquire. And he's one of the greatest pinup artists of all time. Uh, certainly one of the most beloved Playboy contributors along with uh, you know, people like Jack Cole and Phil Silverstein and Leroy Neiman. One of my personal favorites and one of the artists who's, who's represented in a big way in the collection because he started doing art for us um, officially in, in 1960 and continued to give us one painting a month, more or less, until about 1976. So we have a lot of his work in the collection. These are three great examples behind me. You know, this is an artist who was a, a classically trained figure painter. He was a really talented painter. And um, you know he had worked at Esquire doing these pinups, and and like Houdini and many of the other artists, he had basically been dropped by the magazine when the magazine took a more conservative turn. So, you know, we allowed him to come over to Playboy and, and start making some art for us. But it wasn't it it wasn't just a done deal, you know, from the beginning when Art Paul decided that he wanted to pursue Vargas and have him in the magazine. He had to convince Hess to put him in there. Hess was actually a big fan of Vargas's, but um, you know, he had to be convinced that we needed another artist in the mix because by that point we had so many regular contributors. And the way that uh, Art convinced Hess to include Alberto was by telling him that we could have more nudity in the magazine without having to have more photography. And so that's how Vargas ended up in Playboy. It was, it was a way to have you know, more girls in the book without having too much photography because at that point we felt like uh, the, the, the visual mix of the magazine was just right. Uh, we didn't want, you know, another pictorial. So Vargas made his debut in uh, September of 1960. He would do one painting a month and send it in to us. Um, oftentimes we would go back and forth with him. You actually see a sketch of a Vargas painting here that's, that's not from our collection. It's from the Martinetti collection. But I recognized it right away as a sketch for one of our paintings. He would send in... Uh, what we called tissues, which were the sketches for the final paintings, and our editors would, you know, suggest to him, you know, make her blonde, make her taller, uh, put a prop with her, you know, whatever, and they'd go back and forth like this until they came up with a finished painting. That's how it typically went, but sometimes he would just send in a painting and it would be so amazing that we would just go with it um, right then and there. The editors came up with the captions. Vargas would not come up with the captions himself. Uh, he would send in the painting, and then the editors would compete for the opportunity to, to come up with the funniest caption. And so everybody looked forward to when the Vargas came in house. And a lot of people got to where they would have captions stored up. You know, they would just think of like captions that could go with almost any Vargas, you know, or they would think of a Halloween Vargas caption. They would just have that ready to go. And when the Vargas came in, they'd run over to the editor and uh, suggest their caption. Um, one of the greatest things for me has been the ability to go through his letters and to read the, 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 
process that he went through to come up with his art and the give and take between him and the editors. And, and one of the surprises for me was that you know, he was a very conservative guy who, who often had to be um, you know, motivated to make women sexier, to make a picture more revealing. And so a lot of these letters were asking him, like, you know, could you make her, could you open the blouse a little bit more? You know, could you make her a little bit sexier? And, and he was always a very demure kind of guy, uh, family man, married to the same woman his uh, entire adult life, Anna May. Even after she passed away, he would sign his letters, Love, Alberto, and Anna May. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes he felt like we were wanting him to make the paintings too sexy. And we would say, no, Alberto, make them sexier. And so this give and take is one of the most interesting aspects of his relationship with Megan. I didn't realize these were going to be hanging behind me. <laughs> or I would have brought them earlier. This is Don Lewis. He's another pinup artist that worked for Playboy. Um, John primarily made art for VIP magazine, which was our Playboy Club magazine. So if you were a Playboy Club member, you would get this magazine in the mail, and it would tell you everything that would be happening at the Playboy Clubs. So if, if uh, Liza Minnelli was going to appear you know, for one night at the Playboy Club, you were going to find out about it in uh, VIP magazine. And so in many ways, this magazine imitated Playboy. It was much thinner. You know, it wasn't the lavish production that Playboy was, but uh, we had pictorials in it, oftentimes of the bunnies, you know, showing various bunnies from the clubs throughout the country and eventually the world. And um, also having some service features that talked about fashion. There was an article that, that we uh, had in there a lot called the VIP look. And typically in the VIP look, we were telling you, suggesting to you that you wear a smoking jacket when you come to the Playboy Club, you know. And then we also had John Lewis do pinups for VIP. Uh, he was the Vargas of VIP, if you will. And uh, he also appeared in Playboy, but very rarely. So this was one that was done for VIP. It's actually an unpublished work. Uh, so it, it was never published in either magazine, but it was made for VIP. And you can see this is a bikini bunny wading into the pool at some of the Playboy clubs, we had pools. And so while most of the bunnies wore the typical bunny costume that you all know of with the bodice and the fluffy tail and the ears, uh, the bunnies that worked out at the pool wore bikinis. And that was so that they could wade into the water with your tray so that you didn't have to get out and towel yourself off to do your, your drink. Don is one of the few Playboy artists from the early years of the magazine who is still living. And this is a recent work by Don. This is from 2008. Uh, we, we just recently started opening Playboy clubs again. In the mid-1980s, we closed all of the Playboy clubs. We just felt like that was an idea that had seen its day, and we were ready to, to move on um, from the Playboy clubs. And so we closed them. So recently, we started opening Playboy clubs again. Uh, the main difference for us now is that this is a licensed business. So, so back in the 60s and 70s, we owned all these clubs. You know, we had to do the hiring and the firing. We had to manage the, the venue. Um, and if a club wasn't doing well, it was a drag on the bottom line. So today, when we open a club, you know, it's, it's a licensed venue. We, we uh, find a partnership with somebody who's already in that club space, who knows how to open clubs, who does it well, and they pay a licensing fee for the, for the right to open a Playboy Club, and then we get approval over all of the imagery, um, the design, and everything that goes into the club. So when we started doing this, we thought it would be cool to have Don do some new bunnies for us. So this is a drawing from 2008. This is a painting. This is a watercolor painting from the 60s. This is actually a Prismacolor pencil drawing from 2008. And uh, Don is in his late 70s. Uh, his health is not well, but he still has the chops, as we say. So he did a series of these for the new clubs. This is for our club in Cancun that's opening up later this year. And the, the caption is, is that me? Because she's seeing herself on the gaming chair here. And so she's like excited that we decided to put her on the gaming chair. 
I love Don's work. He's one of my favorite artists uh, who's ever worked for Playboy. Um, it's been a thrill for me to work with him on these commissions. He's done many more since this and the others that he did for the Las Vegas Playboy Club and uh, the Playboy Club in London that we're opening up later this year. Um, since he made those works, he's also done some with Half in Them, which are very fun. I didn't have any scans of those. I would have brought those today, but uh, some, some images of Half from the 60s with bunnies approving costumes and things. Very cool. In addition to the art archive, we have a photography archive with 15 million photographs in it. And it's kept in Chicago in the headquarters. Um, all of the photographs are in a humidity and temperature controlled vault. And you know, it's a very modest space. You'd be surprised how many pictures can fit into a room that's basically half this size. Uh, but they have the latest state of the art collapsible shelving um, and uh, the storage is, is top notch. So they're able to fit a lot in there. Most of those pictures are unpublished photographs shot for Playboy. So when you walk into that archive of 15 million photographs, uh, probably 25% of it is published film. Prints, uh, 35 millimeter slides, um, you name uh, every every kind of photographic object you can think of is represented in there. 25% of it has been has appeared in the magazine or has appeared in VIP. The rest of it is just unpublished film, and it's incredible what's in there. You know, in the 60s and 70s when we were doing those interviews with people like Frank Sinatra and Fidel Castro, um, Malcolm X, we kept name files on pretty much every notable person in the world who might be a potential uh, interview subject. And so you can walk in and ask to see the Hemingway folder and they'll bring out a folder that's just jam-packed full of vintage photographs of Hemingway. And a lot of them were sent to us from his nephew when uh, we did a piece on him and the family was involved and the nephew sent us all of these photographs. So they're family photographs you know, from their collection. It's uh, really incredible. So there's a Castro folder and a Kennedy folder, and it's just rows and rows of these name files um, full of photographs of iconic figures. This is a picture um, by Mario Caselli of a bunny named Cheryl Vincent from the Chicago Club. The Chicago Playboy Club was the first club we ever started, uh, and it was opened in February of 1960. This is the lobby at Playboy. I just wanted to show you a couple of slides of the space because the next thing I'm going to do is just walk you through some images from the last exhibition that we had uh, in our gallery there. This is a little dark. The slide's a little dark. But you can see this space. You're looking from the 16th floor of our building down to the 15th floor into our gallery area. So you can see these panels with artwork hanging on them. And this is a space that uh, we use a lot for parties and other company functions, and it has these big metal uh, walls that are movable, and artworks hang on these walls, and we can configure them in different ways and, and put up thematic exhibitions. And we do two or three shows a year. And recently we did a show called The Great Indoors, which, as I mentioned to you earlier, was all about bachelor pads. So uh, I decided to put up a lot of my favorite illustrations from the archive, and these are Primarily artworks that appeared in Playboy in the 50s and 60s, but a few from the 70s as well. We had about 40 in the show. I'm just going to show you a handful here, but you'll get a feel for what it was all about. Again, this is a show of artists you know, that most of you wouldn't know. This is a work by a guy named Robert Branham, um, who did these architectural renderings for us for the Playboy pad feature. This is what this, this series of articles was called. Playboy's pads. And you know, he's a guy that if you looked up auction records for him, you might you might find some records, you might not, but his works are beautiful and they speak of a particular time um, in design and American culture and definitely talk speak about, you know, an era of Playboy that was just very much about this very modern lifestyle. This was an illustration called The Weekend Getaway. And uh, it shows you a cool house out on the sticks. And the idea here was that, you know, if you were a swinging bachelor and you had a cool pad in the city, 
you couldn't just have some farmhouse out in the country because when you took your date out to your country home, it had to be just as cool as your urban pad. You know, you had to be consistent. You had to have all the cool modern furniture. It had to have all the clean line. You know, you couldn't just have some cab, some log cabin, or some converted farmhouse. So that was the idea with this uh, with this feature. And so I'm just going to show you a few of the rooms. I don't know how well you can see this in the back, but this is looking into the kitchen here, and it may help for me to just kind of po point at this. Um, you're looking you're looking from like the den into the kitchen. And so you see this very open floor plan, which at the time was unusual. Today it's pretty much standard. Most of our houses have kitchens that are open. They open up into some room, onto some room. Uh, but at the time, you know, most kitchens were set off uh, in a formal way, and you had to walk, go through a door to get to them. You know, here you can just be hanging out in the kitchen, mixing a martini, and your guests can be in the den or lounging around these lounge chairs, and you can still have a conversation. Um, doesn't seem like much of a revelation today, but back in the day, it was. Um, this caption was so funny because it talked about how you could move these lounge chairs around in any way that you wanted, right? These are just some lounge chairs, not unlike uh, really any lounge chairs you would have out by your pool. As you'll see in a minute, there's a pool adjacent to this room um, that, you can that you can access through some sliding glass doors. But we felt it we felt it necessary to tell the bachelor that you know he could move his furniture around and and position it in different ways to get the best look you know for the room. So here we told him that he could he could move these lounge chairs. There's a portable TV in the background there behind the lounge chair on the right hand side. It's one of those TVs on the stand, you know, that kind of swivels like this. Uh, you've got some pole lights. The best the best thing about this though is the rotisserie, the home rotisserie. Uh, a lot of these design elements have stood the test of time pretty well. I mean, the pole lamps, you could go to, to most um, secondhand stores that deal in mid-century design and find a pole lamp. But you won't find a lot of homes with the home rotisserie. But we argued that the bachelor had to have the home rotisserie. This was the latest, hottest design. You needed to be able to roast a pig over an open fire if you're entertaining in your weekend pad. So we had a home rotisserie here. Uh, this was the den. So this is the room. This is uh, during the day. The last shot was at night. You know, Here you're looking probably from the kitchen into the den. And uh, again, you see some elements here that have stood the test of time well that are back in fashion, You know, like this fire pit here in the middle of the room. Definitely cool. I'm definitely seeing fire pits like that in design magazines again. The Scandinavian furniture is fashionable again. Uh, again, though, the caption was funny for this one because it talked about how the bachelor was not going to believe this, but this apartment was going to have sliding glass panels on metal tracks that he could move from side to side and that would allow him to access the pool from the den. Like, just These are just sliding glass doors that you would find on any apartment in the Dallas area, right? But at the time, it was like, what? Are you telling me this wall will be made of glass and will move on a track and I will be able to walk through it? That is amazing. you know. So it was a, it was a fresh design concept at the time. Um, certainly, floor-to-ceiling windows were not standard in most homes. This is called uh, Playboy's Electronic Entertainment Wall. One of the motifs that you see in these bachelor pad illustrations is the idea of having an, uh, an electronic command center for your apartment. Okay, so in a lot of the illustrations you're not seeing today, uh, be they of a townhouse or of a mansion, there's always an artwork that shows like a control panel next to the bed with the reel-to-reel, -reel, right, the reel-to-reel -reel audio and a bunch of buttons. And the idea was that you, know, you needed to be able to control the, the whole home from that one location. We're still trying to perfect this, right? I mean, we're still hearing about the smart house that we're all going to have someday. We just walk through the door and it's like voice activated. It's just cool to see that back in the 50s and 60s uh, that we were already aspiring to have this kind of environment. It was a big deal to Hef, personally. On uh, the Chicago mansion, he ended up creating an entertainment wall that was the basis for this um, 
th these two illustrations that you see here. This is another shot of it here. So as we explained it in the magazine, this electronic entertainment wall offered you a ship-to-shore radio. It had a jukebox. It had closed-circuit TV. It had a slide projector. Uh, it had humidity controlled storage for the Bachelor's Jazz LPs. You know, it was like the one-stop shop for entertainment. Uh, one of, another fun thing about working with illustration, you know, from the 50s and 60s is, is seeing that, uh, you know, some of the ideas behind these concepts have become pretty dated and that the humor has become pretty dated as well. But, you know, it's fun now in a retro way um, to read one of those jokes and to think about, well, you know, it would have been funny at the time or to read the, the reasoning behind having an entertainment wall like this and to try to kind of imagine yourself in the 60s with that same thought process. Um, in particular, one of the ideas that pops up a lot in these bachelor pad pictorials is that you needed to have all of the entertainment in one spot because if you didn't, and say so you had to leave the room to adjust the light or to turn on the hi-fi, it might give your date enough time for her to change her mind. Like, it lit, like one of these articles literally said that, you know, which was just so funny and charming to me. Um, but you know, I think on a basic level, we can still relate to it, right? Maybe not that if we leave the room, our date's going to leave. But, but you know, we still want to be able to have everybody in one room at the party enjoying themselves, you know, and everybody gets to hear the music, everybody gets to enjoy the entertainment, and we don't have to go up the stairs to turn a button, to, to, to push a button or turn something on. Uh, one of the cool things about this design here was that this uh, kind of slat that you see above the wall is a screen that comes down. So you push a button and the screen comes down. <laughs> and you have a uh, a 35 millimeter uh, projector that projects movies onto the screen. And Hef has this today. I mean, it's whatever is the latest uh, version of this. It wouldn't be the old projector of yesteryear. But he still is very interested in having the latest movie screened at the mansion. And so every, every week he has movie night at the mansion. And all of his friends come over, and they watch movies that are out in the theaters right now. The studios will send him uh, a printing of the film, and he'll watch it with his friends. So he wanted that to be included here, the idea that you, know, you would be showing the latest movies in your home. Um, and I don't know if you can see it that well, but there's actually a projectionist room on the right-hand side. There's a little kind of slot in the wall there. That's where the projectionist would look out of this little closet where he would presumably just live until it's movie time. You know, there was actually a a projectionist compartment built into the room, which I thought was pretty funny. This is Hef in the Chicago mansion. And um, as part of this show, we exhibited photographs of the mansion from back in the day. That's a de Kooning painting hanging in the background there. And um, he's working hard on the magazine, lying on his round bed which some of you may know about and some may not. It's a famous aspect of his lifestyle from the 60s. We still have it. He doesn't, it's not his bed anymore. He doesn't use it as his bed, but we still have it um, out there at the Playmate house, which is the house across the street from uh, the Playboy Mansion, which is like the guest house for Playboy. Uh, so we do still have the bed, but back in the day, that was his bed. And it also came out of a um, Playboy pad article. So one of our artists came up with this idea of a bed that would be hydraulic, it would rotate, it would have a control panel on it, like the kind of um, controls that we were just talking about, and it would be like the ultimate bed. And so Hef thought it was so cool he had one built. So this is the round bed. So here's, here you have an example of Hef being inspired by his own magazine to live the lifestyle espoused in it, where more often than not, what the magazine did, especially in the early days, was it depicted his lifestyle, right? As opposed to him uh, deciding to imitate the lifestyle depicted in the magazine. But here you see him putting Playboy together. It was just like this, too. This is not staged. The, the legend of him working in his pajamas is 
true. He still works in his pajamas. Um, he's a homebody. So here he is in his pajamas and his robe. And his room is typically that messy. And so you see all of these artworks all along the floor and folders full of film, etc. So we just wanted to show the Playboy Mansion and talk about how, you know, it was the ultimate bachelor pad in its day in Chicago. And this is a room called the Red Room. Just a very swanky guest room at the Playboy Mansion. Um, I'm guessing that the, the lion rug is probably not PC anymore. <laughs> but, you know, back in the day, it was fashionable. This is a work by Larry Frederick. And it depicts the Lake Geneva, Wisconsin Playboy Club. In particular, it shows you the disco that existed at that club. Uh, Larry was a, like a Pulp Fiction illustrator um, who did some work for VIP. I don't think he ever worked for Playboy, but he did art for VIP magazine. And um, you won't find out a lot about him, but he did, uh, he did some of the um, Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew uh, covers back in the day. You might recognize a similar style in the way that the faces of these characters are, are rendered. Um, and this is one of my favorite illustrations. And this slide does not do it justice. It is so colorful and so vibrant. And it is just so groovy in 1960s. Uh, I like to say that, you know, if I were, if they told me, if Playboy told me that they no longer needed my services and they couldn't pay me a severance, but I could take 10 artworks, you know, I would definitely take the Tom Wesselman I would head right to auction with it. Uh, you know, I would take the Warhol, but there would be some works that I would that I would ask for that I would just keep, and this is one of them, um, because for me it's just so Playboy, and I love the Playboy clubs, and it's a great depiction of the disco there at the club. And you know, I sat out in the in the uh, seats where you are and looked at these slides, and I realized you're not getting some of the details here. But let me just tell you that. It's, it's, it's as if we sat an artist down today and asked him to create a 1960s illustration. And we had like a checklist and said like, well, we have to have a woman in a poochie dress. And we have to have a guy in an orange blazer and, and a guy with an ascot. And we have to have a psychedelic light show happening on the back wall that actually says um, psychedelic ecstasy, you know, and has this sort of beat poet figure rendered in bright colors. It's just so perfectly of that era. And I love the guy in the middle with the white collarless shirt. Do you remember that shirt? You know, in the Bond movies, you often would see the villain wearing this shirt before you realized he was the villain, right? Like at the beginning of the movie, he'd have that white, crisp white shirt on, no collar. And Bond would like exit the room and then, you know, the, the villain would hit a button and like the table would flip over and it'd be like a globe and he would just start pointing at it and laughing or something. This is kind of like that outfit. It's another Larry Frederick. This is of the pool at the Lake Geneva, Wisconsin Playboy Club. Um, this is uh, no longer a Playboy Club, as I mentioned to you earlier. This is one of the clubs we closed uh, in the 80s. But it is still a hotel. And I think it's the Grand Geneva Hotel in, uh, in Lake Geneva. So if you, if you go to Lake Geneva, if ever you have the, the need or the reason to go to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, you should go by and check this out because this pool still looks just like this with these long um, wooden beams making up the ceiling and these big uh, field stone slabs. It was all about long horizontal lines. It was a beautifully, uh, beautifully designed space. Again, this is a really fun 60s image of a guy who apparently has just broken into song on his guitar on the right-hand side. And I love these two guys on the left-hand side in their, in their patterned psychedelic pants, one of them lighting the other guy's cigarette. And again, you probably can't see some of the details, but there are bikini bunnies wading in, into the pool, um, serving up cocktails just as they would have been back in the day. Uh, so again, this show is all about pads, but also about you know, Playboy interiors and fantasy spaces. So we took you through the early bachelor pads that appeared in the magazine. We took you through the Playboy clubs. We showed you the Playboy mansion. And then we ended with this uh, series of illustrations that actually never appeared in Playboy. They're by Paul Alexander, and they're from the late 70s. And 
you know, this was an update of the Playboy bed, actually. So we hearkened back to that early uh, Playboy pad article where we showed the bed that be became the inspiration for Hef's round bed, and we showed you a new bed. And I'm not going to show you all the illustrations here, but I'm going to show you the, the final, uh, final panel, which shows the bed. Now, you're just going to have to imagine this, but the bed is hydraulic, just like the old Playboy bed. But in this, in this version, it's basically an elevator that takes you up through several floors of this groovy pad. And eventually, you end up in the, the biosphere, the rooftop biosphere in Chicago, okay, where you're now looking at the top of the bed. So the man and the woman were standing on the bed, and he hit a button, and the bed moved up, and this ocular ceiling opened up, and then the bed appeared on the roof and just stopped, and now the bed is flush, you know, flush with the rooftop. She's apparently so impressed that she has taken her clothes off. She was <laughs> clothed in the earlier, on the earlier pages. He's jumped right in the pool. You know, it's just this fantastically unrealistic idea of what the ultimate bachelor pad would be. I mean, imagine how hot that would be. You're in this glass bubble cooking on the top of this this roof, uh, but it's beautiful and it's amazing. And and um, you know, one of the cool things about working at Playboy is you get to have art in your office. So if you're a new executive, you come to me and you say, Aaron, I'd like some art for my office. And then I say, Well, what do you like? Do you like Vargas? Do you like Leroy Neiman? What do you like? Well, we'll get you something for your office. Well, I get to have stuff too. And so uh, I like to rotate art through my office. And right now, this is the work that faces me as I sit at my desk. It's about this big, and I love looking at it. And again, you're missing a lot of detail, but it is just an exquisitely painted work. And, uh, and it depicts a view as it would be from a rooftop on Michigan Avenue looking out onto Lake Michigan albeit this version of Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan is more built up and a little bit more futuristic. So you actually see the Wrigley Building on the left-hand side. That's a real building in Chicago. Um, but a lot of these buildings on the right-hand side are kind of like this artist's fantasy of what we would eventually do to Lake Michigan, you know, which is, would be so sad <laughs> because one of the great things about Chicago, if you've ever been there, is that we've preserved our lakefront. Well, here he's kind of saying, like, well, we would get rid of all that park area and we would just build skyscrapers out onto the lake. My absolute favorite aspect of this, though, is the tanning grotto in the back of the bubble. I, I don't know if you can see that back there, but behind that kind of tree structure, there's a tanning bed there and tanning lights on the back wall. Because you wouldn't get hot enough in this glass bubble on the rooftop. You would need to go back and, and tan. So Playboy's always been known for art. Um, obviously, we're known for a lot of other things. We're known for beautiful women. We're known for Hef. You know, we're known for celebrities. But I think you know fans of the magazine who have who have read the magazine over the years will tell you that Playboy's always had more art in it and better art in it, really, than any other magazine. And you know the main reason for this is because Hef started out as an artist and he aspired to be an artist. He's a very visual person, but he also made a smart choice when he hired Art Paul to be the first art director. Um, art was a local artist and designer who agreed to work freelance on that first issue. Uh, you know, thinking it wasn't going to go anywhere, but sure, you know, he would accept money to work on this magazine and do his best, and so, um, so he did, and he became our founding art director. And as I mentioned, he worked for us until 1982. And Art was an incredible art director. He's a great artist, and you know, he's an icon in the design world. One of the things that he did was he created the rabbit head logo that you see here. This is Warhol's version of the logo. It's not referred to as the Playboy Bunny. We, we call it the, the rabbit head because for us, the Playboy Bunny is the hostess that works in the club with the costume, the ears, and the tail. So this is the rabbit head. Um, Art loved to say about this that he was really happy that he only spent 10 minutes on this and that he had no idea whatsoever that it was going to become the corporate logo. And he certainly didn't know that it would become the, the second most recognized logo in the world after the Coke symbol. 
Um, rather, it was just meant to be a period at the end of the story. So just like when you read The New Yorker, say you're on a flight and you're about to land and you're looking for that diamond at the end of The New Yorker story and you're flipping through pages and you're like, where is that diamond? We're about to land. You know, because that diamond tells you that's the end of the story. Uh, that's what the Rabbit Head logo was in Playboy and that's how it appeared in the very first issue. Um, and it wasn't until later that it became our corporate logo. Uh, Art also did a great thing. He asked artists who had never done illustration before to illustrate for Playboy. So he went to people who didn't consider themselves illustrators or magazine artists, uh, frankly would have thought it beneath them to do art for magazines, and he convinced them to do art for Playboy. And he did it by giving them the freedom to really do what they wanted to do and to express themselves um, the way that they wanted to, and by giving them the articles and saying, hey, here, interpret this, you know, evoke this, rather than saying, illustrate this particular scene. Uh, most magazines would give an article to an illustrator and, and ask that person to illustrate a scene like of a, if it's a work of fiction, you know, of a guy who pulls a knife on a criminal or something, illustrate that scene. We would give the article to the artist and just say, you know, evoke this piece for us. And so as a result, they came up with works that were a lot more expressive, that often were very painterly, that sometimes were even downright abstract, whereas uh, the art that you saw in other magazines uh, tended to be very literal. Um, he also asked illustrators to make art, to make fine art. You know, because back in those days, certainly in the 50s and 60s, there was a big difference in the public mind between illustration and fine art. Now there's much less of a difference, if any difference at all. You know, but back in those days, there was. And so uh, he would go over to an illustrator's studio and he would see the piece that the guy had made for the article. And oftentimes it would be this very conservative, black and white, very literal work. And you know, Art would say, no, no, you know, we want you to be more expressive. And as he's saying this to the artist, he would see in the background this beautiful painting you know, or this amazing work of art. And he would ask, what's that? And the artist would say, oh, that's what I do on the weekends. And then Art would say, well, we want what you do on the weekends to appear in Playboy. And so that was his philosophy behind putting art in the magazine. He asked fine artists to be illustrators, and he asked illustrators to be fine artists, and he expected all of them to make art. This uh, is an example of an illustrator who became a fine artist, right? This is Andy Warhol. Um, so you know, he, he's an artist who started out as a commercial illustrator and who really only developed his fine art career later in his life um, and now is the most Amer important American artist ever, I think you can say, uh, without too much argument. Um, and so he's a guy who, you know, he was an easy sell for Playboy because he had done a lot of commercial work. Uh, Andy also liked money. He, he didn't like saying no to work. So if you were going to pay him, he was going to work. Um, and so he did a lot of art for Playboy. And this is just one example of a painting that he made for us. This is a uh, cover um, without the cover text. This is the January 1986 cover by Andy. He did four variations of this, and we just we ran just one of them. And we own just the one, and the Warhol Museum owns two of the other four, and the fourth is, is missing. So if you have it, let me know. So here's another thing that he did for us. Uh, somebody on the editorial staff was asking the question in a meeting, what is a work of art? What is it really? I mean, what does it mean? What, what, what is the meaning of art? And someone else, maybe Art Paul, said, hey, that's a great idea for feature in the magazine. Let's ask an artist you know, what, what a Warhol is or what, what, a, what a Rosenquist is. And then whatever they make, we'll put in the magazine. So we did that with Andy. We asked him, you know, what is a Warhol anyway? So just you know, a answer this question visually, send us whatever you got, and we'll put it in the magazine. So he just smashed his face against a Xerox machine several times, and then kind of haphazardly colored it in with markers, sort of dotting the face and different things, and then sent them in, and they were all, I mean, they were just copy paper, you know, with these markings all over them. And we published it. This is a painting by Tom Wesselman from January of 1967. 
Um, and it's from an article called The Playmate is Fine Art, where we asked a group of 11 artists to interpret the Playmate in different ways. Most of the art that you see in the collection appeared in the magazine as illustration, uh, illustrating stories. But sometimes we would uh, do pictorials of an artist's work where, say, we were sort of visiting pop art as a trend or we were showing you um, the latest works by Leroy Neiman. This is kind of a mixture of those two things. Here, here we were giving the artists a concept to work with, this concept of the playmate, and asking them to riff on it. And then we basically just published the works that they made, along with photographs of them working in the studio. So this is, a, this is about a six-foot shaped canvas, uh, oil on canvas by Tom Musselman. You know, they all did something different. Um, just checking to see how many other works they have from this series here. Uh, Warhol actually took a, a still from one of his movies, Frankenstein, and he and he made a painting of that. Salvador Dali did a nude that hangs in the Playboy Mansion today. Alfred Leslie did uh, a nude of a woman with an appendix scar and a mole, making the point that for him, it was those little characteristics that made her special, made her beautiful, and made her a playmate, and not those characteristics that she shared with all other women, like her breasts. You know, so they all they all took their um, took an opportunity to put their spin on this idea of the playmate. For Wesselman, the most beautiful aspect of a woman was her mouth, and all you need to know about a beautiful woman is that she has great teeth and ruby red lips, and so he was drawing this series of mouths at the time. This is uh, mouth number eight in the series. And he thought it would be perfect for this feature. And so we did too, and we bought it. We, we bought 11 works for this feature. We bought a Rosenquist, a Wesselman, uh, Larry Rivers, uh, a George Siegel, um, the Warhol. Those are the major ones. And altogether, they cost us $40,000 which you know, wasn't an insignificant amount of money at the time, but certainly pales in comparison to what you know, that would be worth today. This is the Wesselman. This is a cast of Larry Rivers. I mean, this is the Siegel, rather. This is a cast of Larry Rivers' pregnant wife at the time. So Larry Rivers was another artist that, that did work for this pictorial, and uh, his wife was pregnant, and they were friends, and so Siegel did this cast of her. So for him, a pregnant woman was the most beautiful woman of all and the ultimate playmate. Uh, this is a work by Brad Holland, a great artist who worked for us primarily in the 60s and 70s. Um, his regular feature was called Ribald Classics. But this is an illustration for the best little whorehouse in Texas. So as many of you know, you know a lot of people do read Playboy for the articles. We excerpt books uh, on a regular basis in the magazine. We were the first um, American publisher to publish any of Ian Fleming's works. We were the first magazine to publish Kerouac. Uh, and we also published The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. And here's the illustration that went along with it. Uh, Brad's one of my favorite artists. He was a great painter. Um, and this is one of the best works that he ever made for us. And this is a great example of you know, a work that is you know, very expressive. It's very interesting. It's very dynamic. But would you know that this, this is the best little whorehouse in Texas if you saw this image? No way. You know? This is an Ed Paschke. Uh, many of you will know Ed as a Chicago imagist from Chicago and uh, one of the most iconic artists from the city. Um, started working for Playboy in the 1960s. Art Paul actually taught at the Art Institute for a short period of time, and Leroy Neiman taught there as well. And Leroy had actually gone there as a student. And so they had a lot of contacts at the school. So you know, one of the reasons that we were able to get so many great artists in the magazine, especially in the 60s, was because Art and the art directors that he hired had all these connections with the Art Institute of Chicago. And we would hire students when they were still in school or when they were right out of school and give them commissions. And Ed Paschke was one of those artists that we hired when he was still at the Art Institute. Keith Haring, of course. 
Uh, Keith did a lot of art for us in the 80s. This is from 1986. It's called Bunny on the Move. We still have art in Playboy. Uh, we don't have as much art in the magazine as we used to. And the main reason for that is that, well, we don't have as many pages in the magazine as we once did. Most magazines are smaller these days. Ours is not an exception. Um, and, you know, it would look dated to have as much art as we did, say, in the 60s and 70s. In the 70s, the largest issue that was printed in that decade was 400 pages long. That's a lot of space to have a lot of art. Um, today, if you were to have as much art in the magazine, you know, it just wouldn't look contemporary enough. Uh, so we have a lot more photography, and of course we have a lot more digitally created uh, imagery than we once did. But we do still commission artists to do works um, for articles, and this is a recent work by Scott Anderson, who is a painter formerly from Chicago, who now lives in New Mexico, great uh, contemporary artist. I know he had a show here the gallery is escaping me, but he had a, a one-person exhibition here in Dallas a year ago or two years ago. He chose the Kavi Gupta Gallery in uh, Chicago. And this is a painting that was meant to evoke the beginning of the universe for a nonfiction piece called The Meaning of It All. And so the, the article kind of touched on string theory, and, and uh, Scott was very interested in that. And so... He wanted this to look like these sort of ribbons expanding from this uh, point of light here in the universe. You see Adam and Eve down on the left-hand side uh, rendered as these sort of cave people walking along. And, and it's a perfect example of how even today artists are still upholding Art Paul's credo. You know, they're making work that is, that is representational, you know, and that tells a story, but that does so in a dynamic way, in a way that is often... Uh, you know, saturated with color and very dynamic, and, and in this case, painterly and almost abstract. This is a piece by Gajing, Gajing Fajita, and uh, he's an artist from LA who is uh, a very well known contemporary artist. He recently appeared in an article in the magazine that was written by Dave Hickey, the, the uh, contemporary art critic, um, and it was, it was called The New Modern Art, and it was just about you know, how uh, all, of these, all of these artists in Dave's mind in some way, in some form or fashion, were hearkening back to the work of the 50s and 60s. And, you know, as kind of a sub-theme, it dealt with artists who had, who had started out as graffiti artists uh, or maybe uh, as commercial artists and who have become very well known as fine artists, if you will, you know, doing very well in the contemporary art world. And so in this case, Gaijing was a graffiti artist. He was an L.A. tagger, part of an L.A. tagging crew, who is now um, a very successful artist whose works sell for, you know, big works sell for $100,000 to $200,000. Uh, this is a painting by Tara McPherson. I just wanted to touch quickly on a project that we're doing with the Warhol Museum. We're doing an exhibition there in March on the 27th. And uh, it's called Bunny Redux, and it's, it's, it's all about Playboy bunnies because this year is the 50th anniversary year of the Playboy bunny. So we're celebrating it in a lot of different ways, and one of the ways in which we're doing it is by having this exhibition at the Warhol uh, with contemporary artists who are interpreting uh, the bunny in some way. So very much like those artists you know, put their spin on the Playmate in the 60s, these artists are doing bunny art. So we have a really great mix of, of people from uh, emerging you know, New York artists to international names, uh, people who are part of the underground art scene, you know, the, the designer toy scene like Tara McPherson, um, you know, all doing cool bunny art. And it's great. We're going to have a, a wonderful mix of video and sculpture and, and uh, painting works that are going to be fairly abstract where it might be a little tough to, you know, make out a bunny with a bunny theme, and others like this that are very, that are much more literal. This is a slide of the Playboy Club in Las Vegas at the Palms. And I just wanted to mention briefly how we use a lot of these assets uh, as a company that is a public company, you know, that is charged with the responsibility of making uh, profits for its shareholders. Um, 
So we, we license a lot of the assets that we have. So we own the rights to a lot of the images that you've seen, and we license them to people who may, may want to make products, or in this case, want to open a Playboy Club and want to have those images featured uh, in that venue. So here you're looking at the VIP bar at the Playboy Club, and on the right-hand side you see this plasma screen, and there's an image on there of a jet bunny, which are the bunnies that used to work on Hef's DC-9. And that plasma shows a slideshow of images and video, uh, some of the images you've seen tonight. Just you know, appear on that screen when you're in that space. And then across from that are all of these uh, screens that are set up in a big grid that show you various artworks and photographs from the collection as well. Um, I have a few shots of the Hugh Hefner suite there. There's a big suite that uh, is a $40,000 a night suite if you want to stay in it at the Palms. It's where Hef stays when he goes to Las Vegas. Um, I just wanted to show these to you to, sh to, to make the point that we also curate art in these spaces as well. So here you see a big Sebachrome uh, photograph by Tom Kelly of Marilyn Monroe. And here you see uh, Vargas. This is an original Vargas hanging in this room. So if you're George Clooney and you stay in the suite, you know you get to have Vargas's in your room. Uh, we are, are represented by Corbis, the stock photo uh, company, online. So here you can see the Warhol and the first cover and other images that they license on our behalf. And then lastly, I wanted to show you these Don Lewis pinups that have ended up on the gaming chips at the Palms. You know, one of the fun jobs that I had when we opened that club was to oversee the, the design of all the gaming chips. So I decided, since Don's one of my favorites, we were going to put Don Lewis's on these, these chips. So here you have Don Lewis's work showing up in a Playboy Club decades after these uh, images were actually created. And then lastly, you see here the blackjack dealer with the chips at the, uh, at the club. So that's it for, for my talk. Um, just real quick, if you guys want to ask a couple of questions, so we have time for that, Jared? OK. I'll open it up. Any questions? Go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll bring the microphone over to you. We have time for a couple of questions. Anyone who would like to add anything? While you're thinking of what your question is, I'll tell you that about a year ago, I was at a closed-door business conference, and the, pr the moderator that was moderating the, the meeting thought for an icebreaker with about 10 of us. She asked the question, tell the group a great regret that you have in life. And I'll tell you that mine, what I told the group, was that in 1979, I lived in Seattle, and I was a senior in high school, and I was in the rare coin business, and I was pretty successful at it at the time. And I used to go to coin shows in Los Angeles, and I had a friend who was older than I was, but who was dating the Playmate of the Year in 1979. And lo and behold, one day in the mail comes an invitation to the Playboy Mansion to a party the night I was graduating from high school. <laughs> you can imagine one of the greatest regrets I have in life. I was the good son. I wish I'd gone. <laughs> anyway, so we ha do we have some, some questions? Anybody have a question for Aaron? How do you choose what you want to sell at auction and what you want to keep in your archives? That's a great question. Um, first, you know, let me make the point that we are a public company, so uh, we do have shareholders. And when you're a public company with an art collection that has you know, 5,000 uh, paintings and drawings in it and, and 15 million photographs, um, you have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders to deaccession some things occasionally, especially as those artists' markets uh, become hot, as you know, Warhol's uh, has consistently over the years, but, but as it definitely did you know, over the last few years. And so uh, you know, we try to be strategic about how we deaccession works, and we try to do so in a way that is you know, in alignment with what's going on in those artists' markets. Um, that's that's our first concern. How can we get the best return for the shareholder? You know, is this the right time to, to monetize this work into deaccession or not? You know, we we're never in any rush to sell anything. Um, you know, we just we try to make make sure that it's the right opportunity. Uh, now that having said that, 
We do sometimes have storage issues, as you can imagine, as, as I uh, kind of described to you when I told you about the warehouse. I know Jared has been to the warehouse, so he knows what I'm talking about. Um, you know, we have a lot of artwork. And so occasionally there's a need to thin the herd a little bit. And so, you know, that may factor in as well if there's an artist uh, where we have a lot of his works. Um, you know, he may be a better candidate for sale than another artist. But still, though, you know, we have to be convinced that the market is strong enough that it makes sense to, to sell those works. Yeah. Uh, hi. I own some Playboy cartoons. And uh, when I bought those cartoons, did you, re did you retain the publishing rights? Um, yes. Uh, in general, yes. I mean, that's a tricky question because we may not have had those rights to begin with. So let me answer it this way. If, if we had those rights at the time that you bought it, we do still retain those rights. Yeah, you're just buying the phys physical object. So if I go buy a Warhol, I can't go slap it on a T-shirt or I'll be hearing from the Warhol estate, you know, for sure. It's the same, same with a cartoon. Um, we used to ask that a sentence to that effect be included in all of our catalogs, but you know we stopped doing that because we really haven't had any issues with it, and we, we feel that people understand this, that the intellectual property rights are, are sep separate from the owners, ownership of the actual object. Good question, though. Uh, sorry for being late. Did you make any comments earlier about uh, Gam Wilson? Uh, no, I didn't show any of Gan's work. Um, you know, Gan is a great cartoonist who's worked for Playboy really since the beginning. I mean, almost the very beginning of the magazine's history. And, you know, he, he was omitted tonight just because so many people were omitted because, you know, there have been so many great artists that have worked for Playboy over the years. Um, you know, not because I don't love his work or because uh, I didn't think he would resonate with you. Um, on the contrary, we included a couple of great examples of his in the sale that we're doing with Heritage, Heritage later this month that are very iconic, um, you know, that I think a lot of people who are fans of Playboy will recognize. He's a great artist, and I understand that there's a book coming out that uh, Fantagraphics is about to release a book of his cartoons shortly because they called me this week to let me know about it. So you should, you should watch out for that. Yes. Um, good questions. The, the most famous photographers that have appeared in Playboy, if you're just talking about uh, name recognition, would be Helmut Newton, was a big contributor, did a lot of pictures for us, uh, Herb Ritz, uh, David LaChapelle, uh, those would, and of course Tom Kelly who did the original Maryland shot. Those, those are the names that you, know, you would think of first when you're asking um, who are the most famous photographers to appear in the book. Uh, but, you know, for me, Playboy photographers are separate from um, glamour photographers and the celebrity photographers like Herb, you know, that have appeared in the magazine. And, and, and those, that's a different cast of characters that would include Pompeo Pozar, who is the greatest Playboy photographer uh, who's ever lived, uh, Mario Caselli, uh, Richard Fegley. Um, these days we have uh, Steve Weta and Arnie Freytag. These are all... Uh, either staff photographers or photographers who have been such regular contributors that they're basically staff. Like Arnie and uh, Stephen are, are freelancers, but they have offices at Playboy and they've worked for us every day for decades. So, you know, they're basically uh, staff photographers. And uh, those are the names that I would mention when I talk about Playboy photography. Um, also of note is Bunny Yeager who was the first female photographer to ever shoot for Playboy back in the 50s, you know, great pinup photographer, uh, well known for her work in the magazine and elsewhere. Um, and uh, she did a lot of Betty Page photographs that you would know of. Um, and, you know, she's actually having a show at the Warhol Museum as well. So if you're interested in checking out her work, she has an exhibition that's going to be up at the same time as the Bonnie Redux show there at that museum. Now, as far as you, whether you could go in there or not, um, you know, it's really closed except for to internal people and, you know, licensees or partners uh, of Playboys. If you are in town and, you know, you want to come by and 
ask me to show you around. I might be able to get you in, but it's not a, it's not something that's just open to the public where you can just show up and and uh, ask to see it. Aaron, we've run out of time tonight, but thank you so much for this remarkable presentation that you gave and for giving us a glimpse into the uh, incredible half century plus uh, archive of Playboy magazine. You are a fabulous steward for that collection and Playboy is very fortunate to have you in charge of it. And thank you very much from all of us for being here. Thank you. Thanks.